How are we looking? Good. Very nice. Okay. All right, so like I mentioned, my name is Dan Rabel. I work at the Bassey Land Research Center here in Cleveland, Ohio. Really excited to be with you this evening. Uh, I'm here to share a story with you uh, that I think you're really going to enjoy because you have a front row seat to explore our universe in a way no one else before you has had an opportunity. It's my pleasure to try to bring a piece of that to you. So let's start with NASA. NASA, as it used to be known. Now we call it NASA. So NASA is an acronym, National Aeronautics Space Administration. We have two logos. In the center, really big, you can see it kind of looks like a noodle. We affectionately call that the worm logo. And in the bottom left-hand corner, we have another logo that we use, which we affectionately call the meatball, because it kind of looks like a meatball. So everyone generally has their favorite. I know I have mine. So let me see, by show of hands, who likes the worm logo the most? Is that your favorite NASA logo? Let's see. OK. All right. Very good. All right, now let's see the love for the meatball. Oh my gosh, look at that. All right. I'll tell you what, I will let upper management know. It's very interesting. So interesting trivia about the meatball. The meatball was actually invented here in Ohio by a graduate of the Cleveland Institute of Art who was working for NASA at the time in 1959. It ended up getting painted on the side of our aircraft hangar. It was so perfect that the agency adopted it, and it's one of our main logos that we use today. So I just want to plant that seed that NASA employs many different kinds of people, artists include, and it can make people leave a lasting contribution as an artist to the agency. As I mentioned, I work here in Ohio. There's actually two locations in Ohio for NASA, both in Cleveland, Ohio, and in Sandusky, just south of Cedar Point. But there's 10 NASA centers in total around the United States. There's kind of a map of that. You can see us in the Great Lakes region with the orange arrow. So let me ask, has anyone here visited a NASA center before? Have you been to one before? Show of hands. Yeah, a few. Which one? Call them out. Does anyone know? You've been to Glenn. So Glenn is the one in Cleveland. Yeah. Anywhere else? When you're on travel? Maybe down in Florida? Kennedy Space Center, right? That's the one out in Florida. Okay. If you haven't visited a NASA center and you'd like to, our visitor center for NASA Glenn, the one in Cleveland and Sandusky, is downtown Cleveland at the Great Lakes Science Center. Right? So you kids ask your parents. It's a really cool place. It's built for children, really neat neat experience. Our visitor center is integrated with the science center. So if you go there, you'll see models of the aircraft and the spacecraft that we're working on, jet engines, rocket engines, and all the like. And of course, the gift shop. You can buy some astronaut ice cream. My favorite of all agencies. All right, so let's look at that first A in NASA. The first A in NASA is aeronautics. Aeronautics, flight study of flight. And so NASA was in aeronautics before we were known as NASA. We continue to be in aeronautics. We build components. We even build complete aircraft. We call these experimental aircraft, trying to go higher, trying to go faster, trying to go more efficiently using things like green fuel, <laughs> renewable energy, trying to be quiet. We don't want to bug the people that live next to airports. We've got a couple of major ones here in Akron. Yeah, and of course, safer so we can return everybody back safely from their airplane trip. So, we build these experimental planes called X planes. The X stands for experimental. We built many. Here's some of the ones historical up in the right hand corner. That was the X 15. That flew at almost seven times the speed of sound, 4,000 miles per hour with person in sound. That was back in the 1960s. Trivia, what's in the upper left-hand corner? What plane is that? Louder? Space shuttle, right? Space shuttle. So, that was a spacecraft, but really it was a space plane. See, it has wings. It's flying. We flew that back to the atmosphere. It landed it on a runway like an airplane. So, any time we launch into space, we have to fly through the atmosphere. Come back to Earth, come back 
through the atmosphere. So we need to know how to fly. We need to know how to fly really fast and be controllable and stable. So we need to know a lot about aeronautics. Nowadays, we continue this trend of X-plane development. These are current X-planes that we're building. Top left, you can see a blended wing. This is for increased payload capacity. On the right, with that long nose, this is combining two things. That's our quiet supersonic airplane. So we want to go fast, but we're going to go fast quietly. So we have that long nose so we can slip through the air. That's the X-59. You guys have heard of hybrid vehicles, right? Hybrid cars. Well, there is a hybrid turbo electric plane in the lower left, and then a fully electric plane on the lower right. In order to build all this, we need people that can design and are interested in working on, modifying, and repairing, and of course, flying all of our aircraft. So let me ask, who has flown an airplane before? Raise your hand if you've flown an airplane. Thank you. Great. Who loved it? Who wants to fly an airplane again? Who wants to learn how to fly an airplane? You want to sit in the front. Use the controls, whatever you want. Yeah? I see a lot of hands. Very, very good. Well, luck is on your side because you live in Ohio. Very lucky to live in Ohio because Ohio has more airports than almost every other state in the United States. And most of those airports will be happy to teach you to learn how to fly. In fact, you can sign up for lessons even before you get your driver's license. As a pilot myself, I'll tell you, if you can drive a car, you can fly a plane if you want to. All you have to do is have the one. Learning how to fly will teach you more than just learning how to fly. It's going to teach you about the atmosphere. You have to learn about weather. You have to learn about the plane. So if you want to wrench on a plane, it's good to know how to fly a plane. And you're going to learn about a lot about yourself as well. It will help unlock some doors for you. Here's some people that used that to their advantage. Top left corner, Charlie Bolton joined the United States Marine Corps, flew combat missions in A-6 intruders, then later joined NASA, used his pilot's license and his military experience to join the astronaut corps, became an astronaut, built upon that experience, and eventually became what we call the NASA administrator. That's the boss of NASA. We all answered Charlie Bolton. Pilot's license definitely helped him on that journey. Lower right hand corner, Dr. Janet Cavani, also a pilot. Now there she's flying P-38 Talons. Eventually became the NASA Center Director for Blend. So she was my boss and our boss at our center. So I highly encourage you to consider getting a pilot's license, even if you would like to work on aircraft in the future. Now, at its core, most people associate NASA with space. We do a lot in space, so that's where we're going now. But aircraft take us part of the way there. At its core, NASA is a pioneering organization, trying to pioneer exploration, both in aeronautics and astronautics. So we need aircraft, and we need spacecraft to get us to our destinations. This is a really nice map of all the places that we've gone when I talk about destinations. So this is our solar system. Top left corner, you can start at Mercury. And uh, you can see the Earth here down the center, Venus off to the left, the Earth's moon up above that, moving out of Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And you can see the circles around all of them. Those circles represent all the missions that we sent to all those places in the solar system. When my grandparents were born, we hadn't gone to any of these places. So when they were your age, in school, they didn't get to learn about it. All we knew about our solar system was what you could figure out from a telescope in your backyard. We figured out a lot for several hundred years, but we didn't know anything about the chemistry of these planets and how big they were and what the gravitational fields were and how many moons they had until we sent spacecraft out there. And now, within the span of a single lifetime, we've sent missions to every single one of the major bodies in our solar system, as well as several of the moons, and you can benefit from now, this is all at your fingertips in the classroom, and you can tour our solar system. As we go forward, you can help us contribute to this mission. So let's look at some of the missions that we have out there right now. We have about 100 spacecraft, 
throughout the solar system. We can break them down into little, little classes, if you may. The first are Earth science missions. So this is a family of missions that's encircling the globe, and it's inward facing. We're trying to make observations about our own planet. We started doing this back in 1960. This was the first time we took a picture of our own planet from space. It was a weather satellite, which we continue today. NASA and the Weather Service operate together. That was the beginning of that partnership. That's the picture that we took. A nice analog grainy picture, but a useful picture. We could see North America, we could see Maine, we could see Canada, we could see the cloud coverage of that. I love this picture over to the right from the archives. We didn't know a lot about contamination on spacecraft yet, so you can literally see the blood, sweat, and tears that this team is putting into putting together the satellite. You know, it's Tiros 1, where we started this journey. But my, have we come a long way since Tiros 1. Nowadays, between all of those spacecraft encircling Earth, and this is only a tiny snapshot, you know, we, we look at monitoring snow cover at any given day, vegetation, average rainfall, sea temperature, land temperature, carbon monoxide, where fires are, always monitoring this, trying to figure out where we're at and where we're going within our planet, monitoring change of our planet. Beyond that, the next class of missions is called Heliophysics, fancy word, helio just means sun, study of the sun. So these are all the missions that are monitoring solar activity. And I'll show you some video from a couple. Stereo mission on the left, and uh, we have Soho on the right. So that's our sun, this is our star. Typically you think of it as somewhat static. When you see it up there, you just see a big orange ball. But when you really look at it with a good infrared imager, it's always in motion. It's rotating, for one. And it has a lot of activity. See these eruptions coming off on the surface of the sun? Those are solar flare activity. And when we have a lot of solar flares, we feel that back on Earth. It's warmer here. In fact, we have extreme solar flare activity. You can see here on the lower right, that's playing a little bit slower. Those flares alone get larger than our entire planet and they eject harmful radiation, sometimes out directly at our planet. We definitely want to know about that, because at any given time, we have about seven astronauts on orbit on the International Space Station. And if there's a beam of radiation aimed towards them from one of these flares, we want to know about that. We actually call this space weather. So just like you would look at the Weather Channel and see if it's raining today, you can install the NASA Space Weather app, your tablet or your phone, and see what the space weather is doing today. Again, very important for human space flight safety, monitoring that solar flare activity. Next up, we go to our planetary science missions. So these are missions that we send to all the other planets in our solar system. I'll just share some of my favorites real quick. MESSENGER was a spacecraft that we sent to Mercury. So there's some video of MESSENGER in orbit around the surface of Mercury. Nowadays, you can buy a Mercury globe, which is cool. We have the entire surface in a virtual map. Magellan we sent out to Venus. Venus is a very harsh place. It has acid clouds, extremely dense atmosphere, uh, just vicious storms. But it's also very beautiful down the surface. You can see a, a gorgeous mountain peak here and a, uh, what used to be a river valley at the base of that. Mars is a very interesting planet. We sent more hardware to Mars than probably all the other planets combined. Most notably, most recently as well. We have a Curiosity rover, you can see that. This is the touchdown imagery on the left-hand corner. And then much more recently, Perseverance in 2021, which you can see the touchdown video of that. Perseverance also had another robot on board. There was a helicopter, which we need ingenuity. So if you look in the center here, there is ingenuity hovering. We fly that about once a week right now. Everyone's heard of the Wright Brothers, right? Wright Brothers, first airplane, born here in Ohio, right? In Ohio, a piece of the cloth that they used, that they sewed around that aircraft on the wooden rim stitching was saved by the Smithsonian. It's on board Ingenuity right now after doing the first flight out of Mars. Very cool. The Wright Brothers could have never imagined how far their Wright Flyer 
what it means. So hopefully we're making them proud. Going a little further out in the solar system. So everyone's seen Jupiter before. You know the red spot on Jupiter. Typically you see it like in a painting or a picture, but it's a storm. So here's a video of that. The Voyager flew by on the left. And then more recently, the Juno mission on the right. You can see that storm rotating, big cyclone. That's bigger than our entire planet. And we estimate it's about a thousand years old, the red storm. But the Juno spacecraft on the right hand side, you can see all these other white cyclones that are appearing all around the planet. That's our first gas giant. It kind of looks like a Van Gogh painting, if you've ever seen those. Just beautiful, seeing the fluid structure of Jupiter. Out to Saturn. Is Saturn anyone's favorite planet? Anyone here? Few. It's fun. I gotta tell you, this is my favorite. So Cassini was a great mission that we sent out to Saturn. And here's some video of that. You can see the rotation of the rings. And Saturn now, we think, has beyond 60 moons. We couldn't see them all from Earth. But if you look in the far right here, we found moons trapped in between the rings at Saturn. Little shepherd moons within there. Things, again, that we could not see had we not gone out and actually observed them from a spacecraft. Pluto, previously known as a planet, <laughs> was our last destination in our grand tour of our solar system. We made it there just a few years ago with a craft called New Horizons. It took us nine years from launching to get all the way out to Pluto for that. Like I mentioned, my grandparents didn't get to learn anything there were no books that you could get in a library because there wasn't much to know about Pluto other than where it was and if you had a big enough telescope, where it appointed when to see it. And from one flyby, one brief flyby, we took so many pictures of Pluto, it took a year to downlink them all. But now books are being written every week, a new book on Pluto. We have so much about the interior structure of Pluto. I don't know how well you can see this. What are these lines over here? I see these lines. What are those? Any guesses? Be shy. What's that? <laughs> atmosphere. Very thin atmosphere. Again, something you would never be able to see from a telescope back here on Earth. So hopefully the next time we go back, we'll be able to orbit Pluto and learn so much more. But probably the most important thing we learned about Pluto is why we named it Pluto in the first place. So now there's no guess about that. All right. Another of my favorite spacecraft, Voyager. Voyager was launched in 1977. It hit each of these planets and took pictures of it. Those are real pictures from Voyager. Then when it got beyond the gas giants, it kept going and has now officially left our solar system. We have a word for this, we call that interstellar. When you're between solar systems, you're in interstellar space. So this spacecraft has been working for 44 years, still going, multiple generations working on Voyager now. Think of all the retirements that happened since it started. We think we can keep it going for at least 10, maybe 15 more years. It's a lot better than my auto. It will go defunct someday, but on its current trajectory, it is going to hit another star. It's going to take it 40,000 years to get there, but it will get there. Even though it won't operate, we put a gold record on the side of that spacecraft. If you ever look at a model or a picture of Voyager, you see that little gold disc on it over there in the bottom right? That's the case that holds the gold record. Of course you put music on there. Chuck Berry's on there. It's a classical music. We also encoded some artwork. We put pictures of all of us, pictures of our planet, nature, animals, insects, artwork, mathematics. So that's our silent message. Should anyone find Voyager, even if it's not working, the instructions are on the outside of that, how to build the record player, <laughs> drop the needle, and extract all that information. So cool message from home embedded on Voyager. And then very lastly, the last class of missions would be astrophysics. So these are all the big telescopes out in space, outwardly looking at other galaxies, at other solar systems. Hubble would, would be probably the most famous one right now. Hubble's pretty old itself, 30 years 
Hubble's been out there taking images just like this. This is Star Cluster Wonderland, all that area. Made over one and a half million observations with Hubble. It's broken several times, but we love Hubble. We love Hubble so much that every time it breaks, people come out of retirement, donate their time. They did during the pandemic. Pulling every lever, changing every line of code that they can to keep this old workhorse still going and still flying. On the other side of space flight is the human side of space flight. As careful as we have to be with all these robotic missions, we have to be even more careful with humans because safety is paramount. As I mentioned, at any given time, we've got about seven astronauts and cosmonauts on the space station. So let me ask you this. Who has seen the space station go overhead? A few? Yeah. If you want to ever watch the space station, we put new solar panels on. They're enormous and they're very, very bright. So when it goes over, you'll see this gorgeous gold dot just trucking across the sky. Go to spotthestation.nasa.gov. Just type in your zip code and it'll give you a schedule of when it'll go over your backyard. You won't be able to miss it. It's quite an astonishing thing to view. So that's where we're at right now in the human space flight. Always launching things up to station, bringing people back, launching a new crew. But our big mission right now is going back to the moon and pushing onward to Mars to stay building habitats. And to do that it takes many different teams of people to accomplish. Where I work in my particular area is one small piece of this puzzle. I work in space communications and navigation. We have, like I mentioned, about 100 spacecraft out throughout our solar system for all those classes of missions, and the human spaceflight ones. They're very far from home. We help them get to where they need to be. That's the navigation part. And we tell them things, those are commands, and we receive the scientific information back. That's the telemetry. We do all of that with radio waves. So we have this network of antennas on the ground around the entire globe. So as Earth is rotating, one of these antennas is pointed at the spacecraft, and we talk to every single one of those every day in order to get all that telemetry back. I mentioned we use radio waves for that. So do several things. We let the spacecraft know where it is, what time of day it is, how far it is from us, how fast it's going. And we send those commands and get the data back. So, anyone here heard of radio waves before? Seen antennas, right? All right, very good. Let's do a little demonstration. I need a volunteer. Who would like to volunteer? Right here in the front. Come on. Okay. Say hello to everyone. Hi. What's your name? My name's Alexis. Alexis, okay. What is Let's stand up on the stage. What's up, Alexis? All right. I'll stay down here. Uh, hold on to one end of the slinky. Everyone loves slinkies, right? All right, hold on tight. Both, both hands, very good. All right, imagine this is our radio. So if I start moving this, I can send a message to Alexis. It's going kind of slow right now. So I got to talk to Alexis kind of slow. Hey, Alexis. Point your camera towards Mars. Okay, pretty good, right? All right, now I am gonna hold this station. You wanna send a message to me? All right, so moving up and down. All right, everyone can see one wave, right? Just one wave kind of going on between us. That's pretty slow. Let me see, I'm gonna see if I can tell what Alexis is telling me right now. Mister, please speed up your presentation. It's boring. Okay, I will, very good, I agree. Okay, hang on really tight. So if we go a little faster here, how many peaks do you see? Two. Two. We call this frequency. I just doubled the frequency of the wave. Now I can talk to Alexis a lot faster. I can send her messages. In fact, I might be able to send her pictures. If each of those peaks is a one and a zero from a JPEG picture that I took. All right. So the faster the frequency, the more information I can put on the wave, the lower frequency of waves, we can still talk. This is like texting each other. I mean, we're not going to do much better. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Like All right, so that's point number one. The higher the frequency of the wave, the more information we can send in the wave. But there's one rule we can't break. 
Mr. Einstein figured this out. Gee, thanks. That wave can't get from point A to point B instantaneously. It takes time for that radio wave to get somewhere. It's not a big problem on Earth, but if we want to send a message to the moon, it's a little over one second of a delay. So imagine that you're having a conversation with an astronaut at the moon. You say something, and there's a second, essentially 1.3 seconds for it to get there, and it's 1.3 seconds to come back. Now there's this big awkward pause while we're talking to each other. Right? We had this in Apollo. Not a big problem, but when you go out to Mars, you can get up to 20 minutes of delay. Jupiter's an hour. Voyager's over 20 hours. So you send a command up, you're waiting a couple days before it responds and says, yes, I did what you asked me to do, and everything checks out and everything's good. That's the cadence of space communication. So that's kind of lesson two here. We can send faster communications in terms of how many bits, but it's still going to take some time for them to get in there. All right. So let's see what we can do with frequency. And this is what we've been working on in my area. Laser communications. Lasers are way higher frequency waves than radio waves. So now we can connect spacecraft together with laser beams instead of radio waves. And that's what we're doing. So we have little telescopes on the spacecraft, little telescopes on the ground, so we can communicate between each other. We go 100 to 1,000 times faster, which means now, not only can we send pictures, we can stream video across the laser beam. We've flown this several times in space, and we've got a few other missions that are having this on board in the near future. This sounds really good, everyone, right? The laser sounds awesome. It is, but there's no free lunch. You have to point the laser beam. Pointing is hard. All right, who's played basketball? Raise your hand. I thought I'd see more hands. Who's played basketball? All right. Foul line. Who's made a foul line shot? Right here. Who's made a basket from the foul line? How, how many points is that? How many points is that? From the foul line. One point. Absolutely. Okay. So who's made who's made a basket from the foul line? Raise your hand again. Foul line shots. Real good. Okay. How about the three-point line back here? Has anyone ever made a basket from that line right there? Raise your hand. Not as many hands. Okay, those of you that have made a shot, you made a shot from a three-point line? Awesome. Why is it so hard? Because it's far away. Why is farther away harder? I know you got a good answer. What, what was it? Hard to shoot it further, right? And you know why that is? Because if you're a little bit off from the foul line, it's okay, because the basket's a little bigger than the ball. You can be a little bit off, right? If you back up to the three-point line, if you're a little bit off an angle, that angle is gonna make a big displacement by the time the ball hits the basket. Well, we're talking about communicating with lasers between planets. So this is a really, really tough problem. So I need some help with this problem. I need another volunteer, and I need a volunteer who's very patient. Patience is your thing. Okay, man right here, come on up. Okay, okay. Here you can just see those on your porch. Push that button. That's okay. The only rule using a laser pointer, shine it in anyone's eyes. Trust me, you didn't want it. Aim it at the earth. Now, I want you to be as still as possible. If you can hold your breath, do that. Maybe we should all hold our breath too. As long as that laser is on there, we're streaming video back to Earth. So you're the spacecraft. That's your laser communications payload. Everything's good. Notice how the beam's still wandering? Are you breathing? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I'm getting worried. Okay. The beam's moving around. We have technical terms for this. We call it jittering. It's the jittering of the beam, right? That's pretty hard. Okay, good. Hold on for a sec. You can turn it off if you want. I need another volunteer. All right. Come on up. Yep. Now that's if we want to aim a laser right at the Earth. But we can't do that all the time. Sometimes, something in the way. 
So, you are the relay station. For real. You're going to relay the beam. Here's your payload. All right, just hold that right in your chest. It's going to be the easiest thing. Like stable against the chest. There you go. All right. This should work out. All right, Liam, what I need you to do take your laser. Remember, don't shine it in the eye. Keep it right in the middle of the mirror. Perfect. Yeah. Take where the beam is. It's up there. So it's slowly turn to your left. And a little bit down. And try to get, oh, there you go. How hard is this? Is this our three point shot? <laughs> so we can sometimes do that, but we've got two bodies moving around, jittering. This is worse than twice as hard, right? <laughs> You're doing good. <laughs> but this is our spacecraft. Our spacecraft are always moving around, right? If you can sit on the floor, it might be a little easier. Standing, we're wobbling around. Okay. Good though. But it is very hard to point the beam. So that's. That's kind of the takeaway here. Laser com is great. Out of the eyes. Uh, okay, very good. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you for going on the All right. So oftentimes we have to relay the beam because we have stuff in the way. And now everything has to point through each other in order to relay those beams back to Earth. This is where we're going, like I mentioned, back to the moon. We have a name for this, Artemis. When we first went to the moon, we called those missions Apollo. Greek mythology, Artemis is the sister of Apollo. So we're going back to the moon. We name the mission Artemis. It's a pop quiz at the end of this. That word, that word, it's Artemis. And so we're gonna have robots on the surface. We're gonna have orbiters. We're gonna have humans going back and forth. We've got uplinks, we've got downlinks, we've got crosslinks. And we need a lot of people to help us pull this off. Which brings me to the end here. My role is space communications and navigation. We're just one tiny piece of the pie in order to make this happen. NASA is a small city. We need all kinds of people to make it happen. Of course we need people that are scientists and engineers and mathematicians, but you're smart. You knew that already. But we need more than that. We actually have space lawyers. We need space lawyers. There's some hard legal issues out there in space. We need managers. We need accountants. We need people that can help keep our information secure. Anything we do, we're always serving on a team because our challenges are too hard for any one person to accomplish. And on that team, we've got people with all different types of skill sets working on our little piece of the pie. If you think about any portion of what NASA does, maybe human spaceflight, for example, one of the things we need to do to keep an astronaut healthy and happy on orbit? Well, they have to have nutrition. So we need nutritionists, not only to make the meals, but study the right meals to make. We need people looking at how to do farming either on orbit or down on the surface of another planet or our moon. How does exercise work in zero gravity? Not well, not well at all. So we've got a lot of people uh, looking at physical health, physical training of astronauts, both inside a spaceship or down on a habitat. A lot of these pictures that I've been sharing with you this evening, in the arts, we've got people that are wonderful at taking photography, videography, that's where I got a lot of these images are from people who are talented in those domains. Who likes to build stuff with your hands? Wow, a lot. That is a valuable, valuable skill in the 21st century. NASA is craftsmanship. It's the backbone of what we do, and a lot of what we build has never, has never been built before. So not only do we have to build the things, if we want to excavate another planet, we have to build the excavator. We have to build the tools to build the excavator. So tool making, tool and die making, machining, electronics. Here's the inside of a rocket. That's what it looks like. You gotta wire in all of that. Beautiful lacing in, all the avionics wiring. So if you like to work with your hands, promote that, develop that. There's a role for you. 
that they ask. I can see you in any of these roles. I believe in you. But that really doesn't matter. What does matter is what you think. If anything I've shown you this evening strikes a chord, and you want to pursue any of the jobs and people that I share with you tonight, there will be a role for you at NASA. It's on you to decide what that is. And in fact, when you're starting out at your age, that can be harder than anything. Just figuring out what it is you want to do. And that's okay. You can take as long as you need on that. But once you decide what it is you want to do, aim for the stars. It's easy to say, it's hard to do. There can be a lot of diversions. Sometimes you just don't feel good. Sometimes you get distracted with something else. That's normal. It happens to all of us. The important thing is, when you put that pin, what you want to do far out in the future, when you get time to come back from those distractions, feeling good again, you get back on target. The people I shared with you in these slides, they're not going to be there when you graduate. They'll be retired. I'll be retired. That's a good thing for you. It's going to be your agency. It will be time for you to take it over and to add to that map. And then the future tense will become the past tense. But we're here now for you. We'll be here for years. So anything we can do to help, let us know. Continue to shoot for the stars. So thank you for your time. And I want to mention, I've got some wonderful people in the back here. We Lindsay, Molly, and Tim. If you haven't met them and talked with them, find some time. They'd love to talk with you more about anything here, about our models, about our virtual reality experience. And Godspeed to you all.